Welcome to the People of AI podcast, showcasing inspiring people with interesting stories in the field of artificial intelligence. I'm Ashley Oldacre. Let's jump right in. This podcast is sponsored by Google. Any remarks made by the speakers are their own and are not endorsed by Google. Trigger warning. This episode mentions suicide and some people might find it disturbing. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashley. Welcome, Sam and Thad, to the People of AI podcast. We're very happy that you're here. Hello. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's an honor. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Yay. <laughs> I did it. Um, so uh, as we start with all of our guests, I I'd love to read both of your bios uh, before we start the conversation. So we'll start with you, Thad. So Thad Starner is a Georgia Tech professor and a wearable computing pioneer. In 1990, Starner coined the term augmented reality to describe the types of interfaces he envisions for the future. In 1997, Thad was founder of the annual ACM International Symposium on Wearable Computers, ISWC, now in its 28th year. From 2010 to 2018, Dr. Starner was a technical lead on Google's Glass, which was named a 50 most influential gadget of all time by Time Magazine. Professor Starner has been inducted into the CHI Academy in 2017 and AWE's XR Hall of Fame in 2024. Congratulations. He has over 100 issued United States utility patents on wearable artificial intelligence and interfaces. Thad is a staff research scientist at Google working on sign language recognition, a topic he has been researching and passionate about for over 30 years. Welcome, Thad. Thank you. Sam Sipa has been a leader in organization management and accessibility technology for the last 17 years. At Google, he drives innovations in accessibility technologies and maintains research portfolios that are global in scale. Most importantly, he elevates product experiences for users with deafness and other disabilities, bringing equity and an increase in, in, in quality of life to Google's consumers. A tireless evangelist, Sam was instrumental in influencing Google to make products more inclusive. You can see the results of his impact on all of Google's products. Sam's longtime passion is to advance the deaf community in any way he can. He's also an expert on advocating employment rights for underrepresented workers, especially for the deaf and hard of hearing population. Because of his expertise in workforce diversity management, Sam has been invited to give keynotes of over 100 business conferences on leadership and diversity best practices. For fun, Sam enjoys traveling internationally with his deaf wife and three hearing daughters. Welcome to you both. Thank you. We would love to start off by hearing both of your stories about how you started off. Um, and we'll start with that, with you, and tell us, take us as far back as you like. Um, yeah. Well, when I started playing with computers, uh, it was when I was 12. But by age of 14, I read a book called Machines Who Think by Pamela McCordick. And that was all about how to create artificial intelligence. And I was hooked. I decided that what I wanted to do with my life is become a professor at a top-ranked university teaching artificial intelligence. And that's how I ended up at Georgia Tech. Wow. But so, so in the environment that you grow up in, because I, I remember hearing on you know the podcast on Invisibilia that you grew up very far away from technology. Yes, I was in um, a little suburb of York, Pennsylvania called Dallas Town. And you know, the you know, fields and cows were pretty, pretty nearby. So uh, I had to uh, work pretty hard to find the resources I need to learn about AI and, and computing. So like, how did you, was it complete happenstance that you came across this book? Or was there already sort of this concept of machines or technology that you sort of gamed from either no television or, or, or hearing something? Or how, how did that like interest even, like what was, the, what was it that led you to even start to like to pick up that book? Well, um, first of all, I was very into computer video games, which were, you know, it was Atari 2600 and, and ColecoVision and Pong back then. And so I really wanted to learn how to program them. Um, but, of course, I was also, you know, in the library a lot and ran across this book uh, at the Mar Martin Memorial Library in York. 
and uh, it changed my life. It was just a hapless stamps I, I happened across it. So how how did it change your life? Well, so I knew that I wanted to program, but then I want then I had an idea of exactly what sort of thing I wanted to program, and so I started looking at making agents that can help you in your daily life. Um, pretty soon, uh, when I got into college, um, I started looking at making headboard displays and wearable computers that could actually help you on a second by second basis. Uh, for example, I was making AI eyeglasses at the time. This is about 1993 where the system would listen to what you were saying, like this conversation, and then in the display, pull up past emails or past conversations that might be relevant to what you're currently saying. And this idea of having an AI listen in to your conversation and help support you as you're speaking, I thought was really powerful. And in fact, this is something that um, I showed to Larry and Sergey back in 1998. Uh, we all went to the same conference called New Paradigms in Computing. Uh, I think um, Terry Winograd brought them and, and Marvin Minsky brought me. Um, and these were people well known in, in the AI field. And uh, when you have a, a big head worn display on, uh, my systems back then were, you know, like this big and had a shoulder pack goes down, down to my waist with a analog cellular phone connection. And it was quite, quite bulky. And I had a little one handed keyboard called a Twiddler I used for typing. Um, when you look like that at a computer conference, people stop you and ask, you know, what? is that thing. Yeah. And indeed, uh, Larry and Sergey did. And I was telling them about the remembrance agent, this idea of the system that helps prompt you with information from your past uh, Wait, while did, you're in conversation. Did you know them? Did no, no, it was the first time we met. This is before Google um, right. at the company. Um, but they were they were grad students with Terry at the time. And um, uh, we were, you know, exchanging information. I was giving them a demonstration of the system. I think uh, Sergey uh, and both Sergey and Larry put it on. I was, and they were talking about their research project from the National Science Foundation called Google, um, where they were trying to improve web search. Um, instead of having the the uh, right link show up in number 13 on the second page, uh, they were trying to get the right link in the first four hits, um, magical four blue links. And I was talking to them about how useful that would be to have that on your eyeball. Um, when you're talking to somebody and, and you try to look up information, uh, trying to multiplex your attention is very hard and trying to do a web search um, causes these long pauses in conversation that are very awkward as you look things up. So doing making it autom more automatic, making it more on uh, on point was a huge win. And they, matter of fact, they offered me the, uh, the Google index at the time for my wearable computer. But that was 1998. They went on to found the, the company and um, uh, hiring some of my, my grad students over the years. And then when Android came out, I was send, I sent, I think I tried to call Larry and I think I sent Sergey an email saying, now that you're doing these cell phones, why don't we look at doing wearable computers? And the next thing I knew, I was actually out at Google uh, helping to make Google Glass. Um, and that's actually how I initially ran into Sam. Um, we had a lot of things we we're doing with Google Glass, um, but one of the things we we're looking at is captioning for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. And so Sam was one of our original uh, uh, users to test this thing out with. And um, and we soon discovered that we both have a passion for American Sign Language. Uh, me, my master's thesis was on recognizing American Sign Language, and I was working with the deaf community, um, trying to make a better sign language recognizer. And when I realized he was interested in this too, we kind of formed a bond and uh, uh, have been doing more in the past two years uh, uh, to advance the, the field than the past 30 of my life. Wow. So, so, so much, so much as information has been packed into, <laughs> into what you just shared. And I, I kind of want to unpack just a couple of things. So, so you, you know, you, you read this book on, on machines and that is kind of what sparked you to want to be able to program and sort of interact with machines and then you took it a step further to basically be able to learn how to code and program machines to yourself to basically enhance yourself uh, well the idea is to you know there's this idea of a cyborg which is right um uh, a person riding a bicycle is a cyborg you know it, it improves your speed um you don't think about it. it's just an extension of your body when you need to stop you just break you don't think about the complicated mechanism right uh, i haven't heard like shoes like 
shoes or yeah. like an extension, for example. Um, so what we really want to do is make these this AI an extension of ourself um, to make us more independent and smarter and more socially graceful. Uh, for example, uh, I was visiting a friend in Japan recently, and uh, it pulled up the conversation we last had so that I could say, hey, I remember that your daughter uh, was going to college for the first time when we were last when I was last here three years ago. How'd that go? She's still starting architect architecture. And, you know, I would like to be socially graceful, that's, but that's something my mind would have picked up by itself. The AI could actually sit there and say, okay, you're in this location with this person coming up. Here's the stuff you know about them. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I really do want to talk to him about his daughter. Um, and so having an AI that can uh, help you live your life and, you know, become more socially graceful, more independent, um, interact with you on a split second by split second basis, um, I think is, is a, a way to have a better life. Absolutely. I mean, well, we, we all live that way with our, you know, our computers and our smartphones as well. So you're just taking it to a much more creative level. And well, once, yeah. Once you, yeah, once you have something like these, you know, these glasses, these, these are, these are glasses I'm working with at Georgia Tech. Uh, they're called the Vuzix Z100. Um, and so we're now putting all our AI uh, work at Georgia Tech onto these glasses. Um, and when you have it, you know, always there, always able to get your attention. Um, it's a whole lot faster than having it on a smartphone or having it on a laptop. And so we think that the interface, the human computer interaction is the missing part in order to really unleash the potential of artificial intelligence. And are you using these glasses now? Yes, actually, uh, there's nothing interesting on them. We're, we're, we're currently uh, trying to improve uh, the interface. Uh, so I'm hoping to get new software hopefully tomorrow on it. But right now, right now they're just on and showing me the, uh, uh, that my phone needs a, a, a reboot. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, what would you use it for? I mean, you, you said, you know, it pulls up uh, past emails or past information about a person, but what, what, is, what is another example? It could, it, can, it, can it translate real time from a language to another? Yeah, that's one of the things that uh, we showed on Google Glass is the ability to translate from one language to another in real time. Um, the real... Difficulty, though, is making it so it just looks like a normal pair of glasses. Right. Uh, this is okay. It's not quite there yet. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, glass look like this. And so um, whenever you're using it, you're looking up at it. And it was very apparent you're using it. Right. We're trying to get it so that, you know, when you're using it, um, uh, it's it's not apparent at all. It's just part of you. And it doesn't get in the in the way of the social interaction. Well, I've seen pictures of, of you in sort of the first prototype of of like way back in the day and it's unbelievable the yeah. evolution that you know from where it came to you know you were wearing hats before and it was you know hooked on in every which way and now it's just it's just glasses it's amazing yeah, the uh, the first prototypes of of glass um basically used stuff we could get uh around google i couldn't use my academic stuff because of uh, conflict of interest um, so I had to reconstruct everything I had in academia using just Google off-the-shelf hardware. So the first system weighed about a kilogram on the head and I think another 10 kilograms in a backpack. Oh. And we made 10 of them and we actually had people wear them around for a month to see what it's like to what the eventual interface might look like. Um, and then we started reducing the size of it, getting it down to something that, you know, I think this is, I think this now ends up being like 42 grams or something. It's lighter than my normal eyeglasses. Um, wow. And, you know, the now we're actually seeing uh, uh, the possibility of making making all that hardware just disappear into normal-looking frames, which I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things we were looking at with captioning uh, at the time was, you know, when, you, when you're, you're hard of hearing and you walk up to somebody in the airport and you want to ask them, you know, point, can you please point me to the bathroom? Um you don't want to have somebody say, oh, that's Google Glass. Can I get a demo? And you end up <laughs> spending five minutes doing right. a demo when you really have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> you know? And so, um, you know, it's one, you know, eventually this stuff will become commonplace and everybody will have, well, at least everybody will know everybody who has one. Um, but uh, when it's relatively rare, you end up doing demos a thousand times a year. Um, that's what generally I do. And, um, uh, you know, but you really just want to get work done for people who are using it for captioning. You know, they want to call attention to, 
to the fact that they're hard of hearing. They just want to get the information of the directions to the bathroom. Um, and so that's where we got to go with this stuff in the future is, is make the technology just disappear into the normal social interactions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so how did you get interested? Because you, you are able to sign. Is that right? Uh, a little bit. Okay. Um, the uh, I can go through a, a technical talk in sign, uh, but my conversational speed is, is still kind of slow. Okay. Well, how did you get interested in sign language? Because it, it, it sounded like you were looking into working with the deaf community even before you met Sam. Well, it was purely self-interest, actually, and this is one of the situations where academia was doing a good thing. Uh, I need a master's thesis, and I just come back from both Bernick and Newman. They were um, their company up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, that helped found the internet, and, and they were also very famous for speech recognition. And so I was working with John McCool up there, who was the principal scientist, uh, on cursive handwriting recognition. I learned a technique called Hin Markov models. Uh, when I came back to MIT, uh, my advisor, Alex Pentland, who is a, a big computer vision guy, said, oh, why don't you try to use what you learned on, on handwriting and apply it to sign language? And I said, oh, this, that's really hard. I mean, we barely have color cameras. And we can barely track hands uh, uh, in the most crude sense. How am I even going to store the data? And he said, well, try it real time. And so I did. And uh, fortunately, it, it paid off. And we were the first team to show that you could actually do sign language recognition at a phrase level with normal cameras. And that caused a, that was a big deal in the computer vision community back then, because almost everybody else was looking at, you know, one, fr you know, a single frame for face recognition or object detection. Here we're actually recognizing language with computer vision. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I got moderately famous in the computer vision community for that. Um, and then continued on with it and said, okay, now we do this. Um, it was a very, very simple, very crude stuff. It only worked for me. It only worked on 40, 40 signs and about 50 phrases. Um, but and now that we have this, uh, what, why does it matter? And it turned out it's very hard to say why it matters. Uh, we started doing crazy hats and crazy things to the camera, the camera perspective, right? So we could see right. the hands. Right. So um, going down at the hands while the hands would sign. And that's what exactly. the camera would, would capture. And using that to allow somebody who's signing to speak to somebody who's hearing. But at that time, smartphones were starting to come out We and the networks were starting to come out. And so this is about 2007 or so. And so we realized that pretty soon you'll just be able to call up an interpreter and have your, your camera phone um, do the interpretation for you. And so we're looking for um, a better use case. And uh, the sign linguist Harley Hamilton uh, who was working with me, suggested actually using sign language recognition for helping hearing parents of deaf infants learn how to sign. Because that's a big deal. About 95% of hearing parents, um, sorry, let me try that again. Um, about 95% of deaf infants are born to hearing parents. And most of those hearing parents will never learn enough sign language to teach it to their children. And it's very important for these children to grow up in sign, to grow up with a language. Because if you don't, you tend to have short-term memory issues, um, and it gets in the way of learning history or math or anything else. And so what we're trying to do is bring sign language lessons to hearing parents uh, so that they can surround their children in sign. It's especially important here in Georgia, where the average travel time for a sign language lesson is about an hour. Um, and oftentimes you have, you know, more than one child. You might have a deaf child and, and some hearing children. So you got to find babysitters and, and make time for this. And, and while hearing parents want to learn sign, um, they soon give up just because there's too much of a financial and, and time burden on them. Um, and so what we're doing with these sign language games on a smartphone is bringing the games to the to parents so they can learn in their own at their own pace in their own homes and learn the vocabulary that you need uh, to to uh, communicate with your yeah. child as they grow up. And we'll we'll get to that because I know you and Sam are working on some very exciting things related to that related to that. Um, but I'd like to turn so so this is a so a fascinating journey of of working on wearable devices and then essentially getting into the research of being able to make, uh, of using sort of computer vision 
to help with translation, specifically with sign language. And so that's how you and, and Sam met. So I'd, I'd actually love to turn to Sam, and I'd like to ask you about your story and where it all started for you. And so were you born, You, I mean, Dad was just giving us a statistic about uh, children being born, deaf children being born to hearing parents. Is that what happened for you? Yes. Uh, I'm uh, one of that majority population, a deaf child born to hearing parents. Uh, and I was actually born hearing. My hearing was normal. I was born with 10 fingers, 10 toes, normal hearing, uh, nothing at all wrong. And my parents thought I was just a healthy baby. Uh, this was uh, back in Iran. I was born in Iran. And uh, my parents were going along with their lives just fine. And then maybe about 14 months later, at the age of 14 months, I started having headaches and aches in my spine. And my parents noticed that. And I was diagnosed with sp spinal meningitis, which caused my deafness. And, of course, life completely changed for my parents at that point. Uh, you know, Thad was talking about parents who have deaf children. Uh, he, he's right. My, my parents were never expecting to have a deaf baby like me. Uh, so suddenly there's a deaf infant in their life. And they said to each other, you know, uh, you know, this wasn't too lo much longer after I was born. It's like, well, we're going to have to do something about our environment. Uh, there's a lot more medical advancements now. There's a lot more interventions to diagnose a baby at birth, but that wasn't around at the time. So at any rate, my parents were highly educated people. They have college degrees. Uh, and so they said, we have to learn sign language. They they figured this out on their own at the time. Nine, like you say, 95% of these parents don't know sign language, but my parents were one of the, the few people, you could consider them the oddballs at the time, uh, that wanted to learn sign language and, and wanted to kind of change their lives for me. Uh, so they moved from Iran to Germany, realizing that the deaf education was not good enough for us in Iran. Uh, they only had education up to the high school level. And my parents were saying, I want my son to be able to go to college. Uh, that's the kind of mindset they had at the time. Um, so they were searching for a place. Uh, it, was, it was when I was six years old. They pushed me into public school, uh, into a special school for the deaf that use sign language. Uh, they had mentors for me. Uh, and, you know, when Thad talks about parents uh, learning sign language as a value. I mean, when you look at the statistics of deaf children who are what we call language deprived, because from those critical years of zero to five, uh, there's no language discrimination in your brain. You can learn anything if you're expo if exposed to it, but those are the critical years to ac acquire it. And so it's critical for parents to be communicating with their young infants at that age to expose them to it about what their wants and needs are. And so this is why Thad's work on this project is so important. You know, uh, it really impacts on my personal experience. I mean, it would be life changing for me, for my parents to be able to learn sign language. They had no mobile phones you know, at the time. Uh, they had to literally drive a long distance to get me to go to a sign language class. So it was just a very interesting time. Did your parents speak German? Uh, yeah, so uh, they spoke Farsi, you know, from their home country. And then when we moved to Germany, uh, yeah, they had to learn a new language. Uh, you know, that's what I say. It was very life-changing for them. It was life-changing for me as well. I learned. I, we didn't stay there very long. We were only there for a few years. Now, from a historical perspective, I learned in, lived in West Germany at the time, and it was still separated from East Germany. So there was another uh, sort of cultural conflict there. But anyway, we <laughs> arrived in America, or arrived in Germany, and my, my, um, my parents knew some English by the time we arrived in America. My, my uh, mom had done her uh, master's in English, er, in England, so she had a, some foundation in spoken English. Okay, okay. So she knew English when she moved to Germany. Um, well, she, yeah, she knew some English because of her grad program that she'd had in England uh, before I came along and we were a family. So she'd had that ex early expo earlier exposure. Okay. So when you were in Germany, your parents had to learn German. And I also, I mean, there's sign language, but there's AL ASL, which is American Sign Language, right? Um, and ours is, it's not, it's, is it different from like German Sign Language? 
Or were you learning oh, yes. American Sign Language in Germany? Uh, there are you know, many different spoken languages in the world, and and you know, and dialects and grammar and sign languages are no different. Uh, right. They each country usually has its own. Ironically, spoken English is common in America and Britain, but the sign languages in the two countries are completely different. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, so German, Iranian, French is all different sign languages. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. So you were in Germany for a couple of years with your parents. And so they were learning sign language with you at the same time. Um, and that just like, I have a four-year-old son and the dedication that it would require to, to do that is, is, is just very, it's very heartwarming to hear that they, that they did this for you. And then, so you were in Germany for, for five, five years. And then how did you end up it's years? just two years in Germany. Okay. Just two years. Yeah, when um, they were learning two languages at the same time, and it was kind of overwhelming for them because they were learning a new spoken language, German, because they had to find employment. They had to blend into society there in order to get ahead. But at the same time, they're wanting to communicate with me. And so they're learning German sign language at the time to communicate with me because um, I'm, I'm the oldest son. I have a younger brother who's hearing. So anyway, they're trying to figure out how to communicate with me. And uh, so, you know, there's kind of like two two sets of baggage they have to deal with, you know, so going from spoken English to German at the same time, dealing with sign language. It was a lot of work for them. Yeah. Do you have any memories at the time of what was working really well or what was really challenging? Hmm. Well, for me, looking back, you know, I think I understood my parents so well, uh, even in my very earliest memories, I can remember being very young because we had a connection. They were communicating with me. They could say frustrated, happy, sad, you know, immigrant life has its ups and downs. There's good days and bad days. Right. So but um, but at least I had a language with them that I could communicate with them emotionally. You know, and when I'm with my wife and other people in the deaf community, they tell me they didn't have that with their families growing up. Uh, their parents were very distant to them. They didn't know them very well. And I realized how lucky I am that I had that. Um, and, you know, in my that's why Thad's work is so super critical to help these children make connections with their parents. In their families. My first reaction when when I heard the statistic was like, how is it possible that you would not want to connect with your child? I mean, like I said, I have a four year old and I would like do everything I can. And it, it might have been even a, a bit of a privileged um, thought because I don't think I understood how challenging it actually is for parents to have access to resources. So, yeah, I mean, that are you do you have you seen that as well? Well, yeah. I mean, we see this all the time. Um, I was up at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, which is one of our partners on some of the research we're doing. And um, we were showing the games we're making uh, for helping people learn sign. And I had all these grown children saying, I wish my parents had this when I was growing up so they could talk with me. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking. I, I have folks who, you know, realize that uh, they got in the way of their child's education um, when they didn't uh, uh, teach them sign right away. And, you know, uh, uh, even speech pathologists um, have had uh, problems in the, in the past where, you know, they thought that, that trying to teach their child English first was a better idea. Um, but indeed, uh, they found out that sign was the right thing to do. And so their, their child had language delays and and sometimes you see mental health issues come up from this um, just because the kids are isolated. Um, so one of the things we see is, is you know, for the, um, there's a, something called language deprivation, which can happen when people are not exposed to language. And um, uh, that can lead to 50% unemployment rates and um, uh, lifelong troubles. So trying to get these, these children uh, signing quickly is, is an important thing. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to add to what Thad was, Thad was talking about in terms of the statistics around language deprivation. Um, this is not uh, a strange thing to the deaf and hard of hearing community because it's something we commonly have gone through. 
this language deprivation syndrome. And not all of us have lived through it successfully. Some have been fortunate to have parents who were exposed to the right resources, but then some not. So there's a variety of experiences we've had with it. Just this past weekend, um, in the deaf uh, person who lives in the deaf community here in the Bay Area committed suicide, sadly. And it's because his parents had refused to sign his whole life. He struggled with mental health issues for years. He, he struggled to communicate with his family. The problem his family was saying was, you need to learn to speak, not sign. And they were pushing constantly on him to try and fit into the what they call the hearing standard, you know, parents' expectations, the, you know, their preferred method of communicating. Total opposite of what my parents did with me. They said, I'm, we're going to adapt ourselves to fit you and your needs. We are gonna, we're going to communicate with you, our son. So the total opposite of what this set of parents did. And he ended up uh, just reaching his limit. You know, he wrote a kind of a, a note, if you will, a suicide note saying, I really wish my parents would have signed with me. So, you know, this is why we're working on this project, to, to spread the news to these parents. You know, you need to learn how to communicate with your children in the way that they need, uh, not to satisfy your needs. And, and here, just this past weekend, we've had more validation of this fact that this is needed now more than ever. Well, and there's so much, so many resources out there for hearing parents of hearing children about how you communicate with your child and even when you speak the same language. And so this makes a lot of sense to be able to emphasize, you know, the language component as well. And like I'm I'm trying to teach my son uh, uh, French because I speak French and, you know, the the. It's it's challenging, but the value in in connecting and, and opening up the 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 skills to be able to express himself in whichever language it is, but to be able to express himself, period, is so important. So whatever language it is, right. whether it's sign language or another mm -hmm. spoken language, it's really important. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The parents sometimes feel it's a burden. It's this. They, they're exhausted. They don't have time to learn a new language. They're dealing with working and supporting other children in the family. I understand that it's a burden. But like you're saying, look at the benefits. You're opening up this way of communicating, this connection with your child. And some parents just don't see that. And, you know, you see what happens as a result. Uh, one of the things we're seeing that's really a positive trend is hearing parents are teaching hearing baby sign language. It turns out that as an infant, you can sign before you can speak by about six months. And by learning how to sign, these babies are actually acquiring the short-term memory tools to construct speech faster than if they were doing spoken language. And so when you teach your child sign language, whether or not they're hearing or, or deaf, they actually acquire language skills much faster than children who are only uh, taught spoken language. And so we're seeing lots of uh, parents now doing this, this uh, uh, th trend called baby sign where they try to give their kids a, a jump start on life by teaching them sign. Yeah, and if uh, I could add something to that, um, you know, that's true because uh, in the deaf community, this is not a strange story for us. We, we know this is true um, because deaf parents like myself who have hearing children, we sign with our deaf children before they can speak. And they sign with us. And if they'll be on the playground, for example, I take my daughter to the playground. Uh, let's. Uh, we were in Paris, actually. We were at the par playground in Paris. And there were other, she was two years old at the time. These two-year-olds weren't able to communicate with their parents. They're just screaming or yelling out something. But my wife is able to sign to my daughter about this or that. My daughter's signing back with her. These other parents are looking at us like, huh, your kid's the same age as ours, and we can't talk to them like you can talk to your kids. So sign language at that very young age is a very advanced skill. Yeah, and it, it comes back to really just the communication and the visual aspect of really connecting with your children, which is what sign language does at such, as you were saying, that sort of such an early age. So this is... this is and the, thing, the thing is that the, uh, um, and people don't realize it's physiological. When you're, when you're born, your larynx is actually in your chest. And um, this is why babies can both suckle and breathe at the same time, is that both tubes are working. But uh, about 12 months is when the larynx finally comes up and is in position that you can do things like the consonants uh, in English. Um, and so, you know, the children are not physically capable of language until uh, about 12, but they are capable of signing at age six months. And so, you know, 
signing with your kid gets some uh, this huge advantage i see um every time i i run across a child who has been taught sign um their sophistication with spoken language um tends to be superior to 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 all my students who's just teaching their children in spoken language i i believe that I'll believe that for sure. Um, and you both have been doing really incredible work with this, but I still want to, we were, we left off, we were still in Germany with your story, Sam. Um, so when did you come to the United States and what for? Sure. So, uh, yeah, there were two or three major changes that kind of shifted the decision for my parents. The first was my mother sort of, you know, for those two years that I was in a special ed program at a deaf school, she noticed that the environment very really wasn't conducive or strongly exposing me to sign language. And she decided this is not the place for Sam to grow up. I don't want him to grow up in that kind of educational system. So that was one big thing for her. Secondly, the European economy at the time, Germany was not doing so well, uh, was, it wasn't very stable. And my parents said, all right, um, if, if we want to invest in Sam's future, you know, there's more opportunities uh, out there somewhere, maybe not so much here in Germany. And this isn't where he's going to be able to fit in. So they decided to move from Germany to America. I was six years old. Um, it was kind of at just the right time because I was able to join kindergarten. Uh, this was in Tucson, Arizona. I had an uncle who had become, was able to host us to be the host family to bring us in at the time. And his home was just a few blocks from the Arizona School for the Deaf. Uh, they had, it's called the Arizona School for the Deaf and Blind. Uh, and uh, I thought, this is the perfect place. I just uh, happened to land there, right place, right time. So I got into that school. Uh, it was a fully signing environment. They had deaf faculty members, uh, deaf, deaf administrators who were fully investing in me as a deaf child. And they knew this was the right place for me to grow uh, in this country, America. And my my parents could see that the community had role models for me. It had mentors. It had the resources. They thought, this is where Sam can really grow as a deaf person and become a professional, become an adult, get a college education, and become a fully realized human without him having to depend on us. So that's kind of the story of how I got to America. Wow. And so then in terms of going out and graduating from college, you got a degree and what did you get your degree in? I think it was in. Yeah, yeah. actually my bachelor's degree was in world history with a minor in sociology. Uh, before I pursued history, I was studying film and animation. That was kind of a passion of mine. This was uh, in the year 2000. That's when I decided not to complete that degree because I didn't want to be a starving artist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a different world than it is now. You couldn't, yeah. with streaming and all this stuff, you yeah. could get a better career. But at the time, I said, hmm, I'm going to pursue human resources management. So that's where I ended up getting my master's degree. I love working with people. I love helping businesses or organizations grow. Um, I just, you know, my goal is to have let everybody have a better working experience, whether deaf, disabled, people in general, uh, you know, because most of the our working days that we're awake, we're at work. We're in a workplace somewhere. And so, um, you know, we, we, we spend more time there than we do with our spouses and children. So I felt like it's really important in terms of my life mission to make that a better experience for people. And so that's when I you know, started my HR career after college, which was at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Oh, that's a, that's a great school. My mom went there, actually, so I heard really good things about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. So, um, Thad, your entrance into technology was, you were saying, video games. And, um, Sam, you said your your entree was, or maybe I would say, like, your sort of, uh, your your introduction also was maybe through film and sort of an interest in technology mm -hmm. through there. And so how did, um, you know, how was, would did you pursue an interest in technology as you were in uh, human resources management? Uh, or did your sort of interest and knowledge in technology really take off when you met Thad? Well, it's an interesting combination of things. Uh, so when I was growing up, uh, it, the school I went to, my K through 12 school, uh, my aspiration then was to become a high school computer teacher. <laughs> that was my aspiration at the time. But by the time I graduated high school, I was like, mm, I really like film better. I don't want to be a high school computer teacher anymore. Uh, but because they were teaching us how to use computers at the time, you know, was, I was sort of a different age back then. 
but um you know, I would always work with my classmates through college. You know, the college I went to, they were all engineers. They were all studying different kinds of technology at the college I went to, uh, different fields of biology, you know, st very strong STEM environment. Uh, and so I was one of the few students who wasn't in a STEM program at this school. I was studying history. Right. But, uh, you know, I was you know wanting to fit in with everyone else. I understood a lot about their world. So at least these concepts weren't strange to me, but I wasn't in it as a student. But anyway, by the time I graduated and had my interviews, I was offered my first job at IBM and in uh, in HR there because I understood those people. I knew how, I didn't know how to code or anything, but I knew what they were doing with their job. So my career was say, okay, oh, you know, um, you, they said, oh, you're going to be an HR guy and you understand STEM. These these tech companies are going to hire you. So I worked with GE. I worked at the National Institutes of Health uh, different with different research sciences, managing millions of dollars in grants and things. And uh, so working with people who are really influencing society uh, all through the different HR roles that I've had over there because I understood them. I understand, you know, so, so, so working with that, you know, it's like I get them <laughs> just by nature. I get them because I've been living with these guys a long time. What's the story of how both of you met? So ch uh, share that and and the sort of and what happened afterwards. So even though I was hired at Google uh, uh, as an HR, I was actually a headhunter. That was uh, my first interesting role here at Google, but. Um, but so I had different HR roles all throughout my career, and I always had sort of side fun projects here at Google, testing different apps, testing different things uh, while I was in HR. So I always had, you know, side side projects going on in those things. And I was invited to work with Google Glass and captioning. And I said, OK, here comes another one that they're trying going to use me to test for sure. And so then I met Thad in his lab. And we started talking about how are we going to use this? How are we going to test this? Uh, this was a, one of the first prototypes of it. And it's a very cool looking device. And it was, it was you know, Google Glass uh, had rolled out, but it didn't have this captioning feature. So I was in their lab. And um, I would, one of the things I was fascinating, fascinated with about Thad was he really gets deaf people. He really gets it. He doesn't have any kind of an awkward connection with deaf people. He's very natural. He knew that he should look at me to talk. You know, I thought, hmm, he has a real good presence with deaf people here. So then, you know, we worked on a few different uh, uh, experiments and, and feedback and this and that. And he took my feedback. He took my feedback because I think he's very worried and concerned about what deaf people want out of this. And so, yeah, uh, this is before the sign language projects we're working on now got off of. Well, then the pandemic hits, and they asked me to do another final testing with with the glass with the glasses, and uh, it was kind of a weird weird instructions. It said, "Drive your car to the specific parking lot in the back of Google, uh, this one Google building, and Thad." is going to walk out of his car and drop the device in a box. Now, this, this is instructions on how to do this in the pandemic. Uh, you can't touch each other at this time, right? So he was to drop the device in a box, and I couldn't get out of my car yet. I had to sit in my car and wait. Then I have to wait till he gets in his car and shuts the door. Uh, at this party lot, I was like, all right. You know, so I was like, okay, can I can I go get the thing now? Yes. So, so I then I walk out, I pick it up out of the box, you know, read the instructions step by step on how to do it. I felt like we we're in a spy movie or something. <laughs> <laughs> like here I'm picking up this dangerous thing. Like is somebody watching us? Somebody's watching, you know, there's hands in his car watching out the window. I was like, wow, there's that. It's it's, it's It seems like he really, you know, I didn't know that he was involved in this project. It's like, oh, it's Thad who's involved in this project. And he, he's could sign through his car window and everything. So I thought, this is a guy, this is a guy I have to work with. So when I transferred uh, over to the sign language team that was working on coding sign language, um, I definitely wanted to reach out to him and talk to him and, and and uh, he's saying, oh, yeah, I know deaf history. I've, I've read books about deaf culture. And so we just started a conversation and it just kind of moved on from there to get into different projects. So from me being a volunteer participant in these experiments he was doing, you know, to becoming uh, partners. And what was kind of fun is you was saying about being able to, to sign during the pandemic. Um, we were one of the few teams that could actually continue doing experimentation, continue doing user studies during the pandemic. Because when we started doing our sign language work, 
um, I could bring people to the Google Atlanta office. Um, we got like special exemptions for this uh, because they could come in, nobody's around them. They go into a room that's sealed off from everybody else. And then I can sign through the window at them the instructions of how to test the equipment that's you know sitting there for them to play with. Um, and so I think uh, that you know in the U.S. we were on the few teams who could uh, safely um, do user studies um, uh, during the pandemic. But it felt like he's he's right. It felt like a spy uh, a spy novel. <laughs> how long did it take you to learn how to sign, Thad? I'm still learning how to sign. Oh my word! There's there's so many nuances and regional variations and things. Um, you know, the uh, standard thing is like, this is what's up. But uh, you can all, if you're at Grand Gallaudet in DC, you can just purse your lips like, and that's what's up. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I'll say something, you know, uh, uh, cabbage uh, in one part of the, of the country will mean garbage in another part. Um, so uh, I'm always learning new regional variants and regional accents. And people make fun of my Atlanta accent. Um, and the, the folks in New York sign so quickly that it's hard to follow. I mean, it, you're, you're continually learning it throughout your life. That sounds challenging, but also sounds fascinating too, because you, it's, it's the introduction of culture, right? I mean, everybody says that language is the window into a culture and it's the same with sign language too. Especially with the deaf community, the deaf community, uh, the capital D deaf com community, um, defines themselves around the use of the common language of American Sign Language. And um, uh, learning how to communicate in sign really gives you an insight into the culture and the community that you don't get otherwise. Um, and uh, uh, it's, uh, I think it's extremely important for anybody working in this field to be at least conversational in sign. Um, uh, I was doing a demonstration at a conference called the Theoretical Issues in Sign Language Research. And I had gotten a native signer. This is somebody who had deaf parents, and they were deaf themselves. I had a native signer teach me the best sign I could. I, so I got all the, the head mannerisms right when I was doing subjects versus direct objects. I was doing all my body motion correct. And I had a little 10-minute demo I could do on a little sign language translation system. It was a very, very crude system at that time. But the system would actually take my signing and translate it to English. It was only like 75 phrases or something we could do. Um, but the end of the demo, I got the best compliment I ever got uh, from the deaf community, which somebody has said, you know, are, are you hearing? Are you deaf? Which I'm like, oh, my, I am so hearing. I think like a hearing person. <laughs> I need you to be slow when you sign to me. Um, but thank you for the compliment. Um, but the, the thing that I didn't realize is that the whole demonstration was supposed to be, you know, uh, the system translating my sign to English, but of course my audience was deaf. And so they said, now, what is it you're showing? I don't understand. Oh, no. And the interpreter who's standing next oh, to me says, no. oh, I'm so sorry. It's speaking his computer. It's speaking what he's signing. And then everybody was like, oh, so cool. <laughs> I did this whole demo and had this whole conversation with people taking questions and they were like, I don't understand you, but why yeah. is this interesting? Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of demos and also be, this being um, uh, a, a, an AI podcast, people of AI podcasts, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about where AI fits into this. Um, my understanding is that, you know, Thad, you've been working on wearable devices for a very long time. Um, where, and I can assume that the one of the challenges was having enough data, so enough uh, s images and videos of sign language to be able to to then process that into uh, a software that can then either generate it in the glass or that can generate it on a computer. So I'm assuming that AI has contributed a lot towards that. But I'd love for you both to share about where the role of artificial intelligence and the technology, how that sort of enhanced what you're both doing and the mission that you're on. Well, I think one of the things that, <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that's really changed is our ability to collect data. So like I said, uh, when we started the, started the podcast, 
um, in the past two years, we made more progress than the past 30 years of my career. And that's because I have a deaf project manager, Sam. I have uh, deaf colleagues at the Deaf Professional Arts Network who, who like, we're re literally working with a deaf rock star by the name of Sean Forbes, who's well known in the community. I had a deaf student researcher by the name of Max Singalia. Um, and I have deaf students here at Georgia Tech, and we're working with NTID up at RIT, uh, the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. And um, Max, who was a student researcher at Google, said to me one day, well, you know, one of the things we should look at is signing on smartphones because the deaf are changing the way they sign um, from being two-handed to one-handed. Because when you're trying to talk to somebody, you're, you're holding your phone with one hand and you're signing with the other. And so a lot of, you know, uh, uh, two-hand signs become one hand. Um, and and it's, when it's ambiguous, you fingerspell it. And uh, so that was like an aha moment for me um, that, you know, our, our deaf student researchers said, hey, hey, look at this. And I taught, started talking to the interpreters um, and they said, yeah, everybody's, you know, sign language is changing. Sign language is, is a lot of people can understand one-handed signing now. And what's interesting about that is from a smart, the smartphones, their selfie cameras are a whole lot higher resolution than webcams or laptop cameras or things that you see you know, uh, uh, normally that we would use. And so the idea that now we can focus on just the head and the hand with this very high resolution, 30 frame per second system, um, and that now we have media pipe from Google, which is the, the hand tracker, the hand and face post tracker, we can do that on device. Suddenly it's like, aha, now I know what to do. And so we started passing out through the Deaf Professional Arts Network, we started passing out uh, 50 different smartphones, Pixel 4As, and we just shipped them to people to collect data with. And it was good enough that we could create the uh, databases that were 10x the size of anything else before. So you, you shipped phones you shipped phones, and then they set up the phones and they signed with both hands or just one hand? With one hand. Okay. Um, most of the time. So we did, we did uh, for one-handed signing, which is what's starting to happen with smartphones, um, and a lot of things you want to do with a smartphone, you're probably be doing one-handed signing for. So like communicating with the assistant, for example. Um, but we also did two-handed signing with the Pixel tablet. So uh, we have uh, data sets now for both one-handed and two-handed signing. And these data sets were 10 times the size of any other data set in American Sign Language that had been around before, simply because we could ship these phones and tablets around um, to the deaf community, wherever they were, and collect the data. And, you know, when I say it's 10 times the size, um, currently what we're working with uh, in sign language recognition is less than, I'd say, 2,000 hours of signing, um, whereas speech recognition has millions of hours of signing. And so, you know, if you think about where speech recognition was back when it was, you know, a couple of thousand hours of signing, it was like 1993, and and continuous speech was just just becoming possible, um, and so that's kind of where we are with sign language right now. We're trying to follow the pace of AI in understanding speech recognition, um, follow the progression that AI did with speech recognition, but we're trying to accelerate it. Um, given we we've seen what happened with speech recognition, we're trying to accelerate it with sign language recognition, um, but a lot of that just requires a whole lot more data. And so uh, 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 that's one of the things that Sam and I and Sean and the team spend most of their time thinking about is how to collect more data and, and how to get the best bang for the buck in creating these public data sets. And then from there, do you train models? Or is it not, not yes. there yet? Well, we had, we've had, um, uh, we did isolated signing first for our game. And this is what helps hearing parents of deaf kids learn vocabulary. And that was a $100,000 Kaggle competition that Google sponsored um, to show that we can actually do real AI, you know, uh, bleeding edge AI on a smartphone. And the game is, is um, PopSign and, AI, is that right? PopSign AI is what the game is, yeah. And so that Kaggle competition, we had thousands of people around the world participate and showed us that we had enough data, number one, to get decent results. And that um, uh, uh, we could have models that are small enough to fit on the TPUs on a, on a Pixel phone, for example. Um, and then we did fingerspelling. 
Um, uh, we collected, I think, three thousand, three million. I think we at least three million characters of finger spelling um, out there. And that another Kaggle competition. I think that was two hundred thousand uh, dollars in in awards. Um, and we managed to see some some new models, new ways of doing that, uh, uh, and so that could still run on a smartphone. And we're getting prepared for a third Kaggle competition coming up now. Um, uh, that's more on phrase level stuff. Um, and so, uh, uh, that will really push us forward and, and that'll be focused on trying to, um, uh, communicate with the assistant, um, is the thought. Yeah. And one thing, uh, that's kind of exciting about pop sign, uh, not just the Kaggle competition, but with pop sign is, um, it's so important because, these parents are really struggling. I mean, not only parents, but just hearing people in general who want to learn, just like you're, you know, yes. you're trying to sign this morning. You can maybe you can go on YouTube, but you don't really know if you, is my hand in the right place. I'm not getting on my, any feedback. Am I is my palm pointed the right way? Is mom done like this, or is it done like that, or is it over here? You know, where exactly am I supposed to be positioning this sign? There's, uh, you know, very few subtle changes in the movement change the meaning. So now with this AI recognizer, we're automatic. We're able to automatically correct you with this game. Uh, so you can do self-paced learning with the game. You're getting immediate feedback on is your hand in the right place or not. So pop sign the game. You know if you want to sign the color red, it's signed like this. If you do something too abrupt like this. Uh, the pop sign uh, recognizer is going to not let you shoot the bubble. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to try to do it completely, you know, three times correctly. If you do it three times correctly, then you're allowed to, uh, you know, aim your uh, thing at the bubble and get the points. So um, it, it's based on, uh, you know, sign red three times with your index finger. You do it the right way. You get the feedback. At the same time, you're learning. Um, and this way... We're avoiding having incorrect usage of sign language get out there in the community. So when you meet a deaf person, they don't say, where did you learn that? So um, so now we've we've got uh, industry published papers now on uh, how this is helping deaf children. And, and what's great now is that we have collaborators on the academic side in India uh, and in Japan and uh, hopefully in Australia coming up who are looking at taking the game and adapting it to Japanese sign language and Indian sign language and Australian sign language. And so the same game can be used, um, uh, just replacing the recognition engine uh, to recognize these, these different sign languages. The same game and artwork and gameplay can be used for lots of different sign languages around the world, uh, all 150 of them. And so a lot of stuff that we have started uh, through the competition and through this effort uh, is starting to see use that we didn't expect before. Yeah. Um, our folks at National Technical Institute for the Deaf, they said, "Hey, really want uh, this to help our deaf children who are who are who are being raised in ASL learn how to spell better." Mm -hmm. and I was like, "Oh yeah, of course that makes sense." Right. Um, and uh, so uh, the the game stuff is really is really taken off, and we're going to we're making toolkits for it. Um, so that people can make their own games. Uh, we have a boggle game that's going to come out uh, using it, using sign language recognition. Um, but we're trying to make a a platform so that uh, a game making platform that involves sign language recognition, both the isolated signs and the finger spelling to start with, uh, that people around the world can take and make their own games um, uh, and really you know make it a whole lot easier for uh, these hearing parents to learn sign in whatever country they're in. Yeah. So, well, just to add that, I think um, this is important because, you know, when I've gone to, uh, uh, I went to a Google Play uh, developer conference. All these game makers were there. This was uh, in Australia. Um, and there's a lot of startups, companies that didn't have a lot of fancy resources yet who would need a kit to make something accessible in sign language for them. So, you know, if you look at the U.S., uh, the sign language industry in the U.S. is worth about $10 billion. This is an untapped market. You know, if you look at uh, the way of disability spending in the world, what disabled people spend, I think there's $13 trillion. So these game developers saying we want to plug into this untapped market, make our things accessible, uh, make these interactive game experiences more real for them so that we can... Um, 
uh, you know, and this is this is all as a result of of the Kaggle competition being able to release these platforms for these people. Um, and so now a disabled person says, oh, this game, that's not accessible to me. But now this game is, you know, these, so a lot of these games are very audio based, based on speech recognition. So something like this with a sign language recognizer is going to change my life. Right. So it really opens the doors, helps elevate the standard in the whole industry. For me, um, one of the things we snuck in there uh, were uh, phrases, phrases that uh, we can use for making games as well. So when I said that, you know, these young deaf children who don't get exposed to language until later on, uh, one of the things they lack is short-term memory potentially. I mean, certainly there's a lot of deaf children and hearing parents who develop normally, but some of them, they're having trouble with short-term memory. And so some of the phrases in the competition that we collected are actually to play games, you know, to tell the hero. We have a, a Iris the cat is our hero. And so you can tell Iris where the bad guys are, like, you know, the snake is under the box um, or, you know, the orange snake is, is under the red box. And we try to, you know, amp up the complexity of the phrases they have to use to talk to the, the, the hero of the game as they go. And so uh, having the assistant phrases with this, uh, we're looking now to see how sophisticated a game we can make that helps these deaf kids go from two to three to four to five to six sign phrases at a time. Um, and so that's kind of a bonus that we're getting out of the, the competition. Um, at least I hope it will. And I just have students looking at that right now. So you have a lot of, a lot of what I'm hearing is, uh, making, uh, technology accessible to the deaf community. Are you also working on, um, the flip side, which is developing technologies for the hearing community to be able to get educated and interact more with the deaf community because it's one thing to bring the deaf community into be able to use technology nowadays uh, to sort of adapt the technology to make it accessible and useful for them but I think there's also this there's still this divide between the deaf community and the hearing community and are you are you working on technologies to you know like like I said for me I special request here I would love to be able to have a place where I can I can go into the computer and type, please tell me how to sign this whole phrase and then have a video show up of how I can sign or, you know, being able to so show it to someone who's who's deaf. So are you working on uh, that? Look for, uh, look for smartsidedictionary.org okay. or, or go look at the ASL dictionary on YouTube. Okay. And it contains about 75,000 English phrases and idioms that are translated into uh, 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 phrases, idioms, and individual uh, words that are translated into ASL. And that's a product out of Georgia Tech, out of Harley Hamilton, the linguist I was talking about. Um, so, I mean, there that, that already exists. Um, we want to include that uh, into products later on, um, uh, uh, potentially. Um, but uh, hopefully it's something that will help get you started. Yeah, agree with that. And I think it's the important thing is, you know, how we look at this is, you know, there's really two different workflows here. One of them is, you know, teaching hearing people how to connect with their deaf children, with the deaf community, uh, or their deaf neighbors, or whoever it happens to be, the deaf people in their environment. Uh, that's very important work. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, communication needs from a hearing person's perspective. What do I need to be able to communicate directly? But then at the same time, the other workflow is how our Google platforms can be more accessible to the deaf community who I, they're just looking for more information. They're needing to connect with the world too. So how can we can make this more accessible to them? Um, is my cough a normal cough? Do I have a more serious illness going on? What's the weather? I want to plan for my vacation. All the things you use the internet for to get information, uh, to make our platform. So it's really to us, it's two different work streams there. One, the communication side, one, the get information side. So, so that means that um, it, it, we're talking about delivering this in real time. 
So a deaf consumer, you know, and we're talking about 70 million signers worldwide, uh, they're not being able to get the information as quickly as everybody else. Uh, every, you know, two to three billion people are using Google every day and getting their information immediately and the rest, and we're over here now. So we definitely want to work on that. But then the other more relationship-based uses, parents and their children, people and their colleagues, these two work streams are connected. They're not completely separate. So we can get information from the search engineering team. They're telling me that the number one search rating for a specific sign language phrase, you know, and these are daily based statistics, right? When they, what everybody's asking every day is the sign for, what's the sign for I love you? That's the number one. I looked at that and I thought, I looked at it 10 times. I thought, wow, you know, who, who's who's asking a question like that? A boyfriend, a girlfriend, a grandmother, a neighbor, an aunt, an uncle, a mom, a dad. <clears throat> you know, that's almost everyone in the world wants to know this, how to sign I love you. So that's made me realize these two work streams are most definitely connected. Uh, and so this work is important no matter which stream you're working on. Has it been difficult for you, Sam, to to, I mean, Thad, you've been in the technology for a very long time, and so as the technology has has sort of come out and AI has grown and developed, you've sort of been a part of that from the beginning, but are you sort of, you have been, you worked at IBM, so Sam, you're very familiar with technology, but like learning, you know, like about data sets and model training and model tuning and all these things, has this been challenging for you? It's been challenging for me too, oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, when I was working, I would say maybe my seventh or eighth year at Google in H year, you know, one of the last roles I had uh, was a, was an organizational development program manager. I was working globally, globally, and uh, with with orgs that were expanding. And and uh, there was one research engineer who came up to me and said, uh, you know, I want you to join our team. And I was just like, I'm an HR guy. You guys sit over there, you engineers. And he said, no, no, we want you to work with us. And like, so I, first of all, I don't know computer science. I mean, I know what I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not a researcher, uh, academic or otherwise. I don't have any degrees or published papers or anything like, thing like this. My family, though, I mean, there's a long line of PhDers in my family. So this is why I'm saying I know what I don't know. Uh, third... I said to him, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm an HR guy. You want me to work with you? And they were saying, well, you've got two or, you know, you could, you could go through two or three career changes, right? When I finished my graduate degree, I vowed to myself that I would never change careers. I'm going to stay in the same career forever. But I thought, wow, this is a really, this is going to be a big pivot in my career. And I thought, do you want me to work with you to start setting up sign language accessibility research here? And he said, well, you've worked with people all over the world. You've been on different teams in Europe and Asia. You know how to bring people together. You know how to motivate them toward getting a goal uh, achieved. And I thought, wow, hmm, he's right about that. Uh, you really don't have to know all the ins and outs about the technology. Uh you know, and being a lifetime learner, I love learning about the world. I love learning about new models and, you know, the different publications and practices and all of that stuff. Um, but, you know, what I could bring here is this ability to bring people together to, to help us achieve this goal, the, the project management skills. And, um, and then my connection to the community. And I think that's what they value the most. So I realized, okay, sign me up. And uh, this is how I got here. The thing that Sam really has brought to the table, um, uh, besides you know, this project management, is his, his deep connection with the community. Um, we hooked up with DPAN because of him. We hooked up with NTID much more deeply because of him. Um, you know, got access to student researchers. Uh, the the they call it the small deaf world. Um, that a lot of uh, uh, folks know each other, and and it's important to have people on the team that the deaf community trusts, and that you can reach out and 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 get access to to these people and ideas um, that you don't get get as a normal researcher in this in this area. So you know, having 
having the deaf community being front and center, I think I think if you count up now, I think fifty percent of the the people I work with on these projects are deaf, um, and uh, it really changes the game. Um, having somebody with Sam's skills to organize the folks and keep things moving forward and motivate people and and do the introductions uh, is a huge, huge blessing. Well, you seem like such a good pair, both of you together, because you bring such unique skill sets, you know, connecting people together, connecting to the deaf community, having this visionary view of how technology can help and knowing how it works and how to keep on improving it. I mean, together, you're sort of really building something that is really, really transformative. And that's one of the things we realized. Uh, Sam and I uh, are at the point in our careers where we said, look, we're going to keep going on this uh, as hard as we can um, because this sort of collaboration is rare. Um, what we have going right now is, is uh, uh, I've never seen it before. Um, so we're going to push hard for as long as we can um, and, until we actually get somewhere and move the needle on this, on, on accessibility uh, uh, in sign language. Yeah. One thing that's really important, um, it's not just me as a role model, but I also feel like Thad is uh, an, an academic and industry role model because he's showing that he's not just standing up on the stage. I'm doing an experiment with this group. It's over. I'm moving on to the next thing. He's committing. He's making a lifetime commitment to this community and committing himself to understanding what their life is like from birth to, you know, cradle to grave and understanding the, to the technology perspective on that. And I think there's a lot of people who work with us on different academic projects um, and, and a lot of disabled people in those communities that trust us um, because a lot of other Fortune 500 companies don't have these kinds of collaborations. Uh, research scientists and engineers who take the time to really deeply familiar themselves, familiarize themselves with the deaf community like that has done. Um, it sometimes astonishes, astonishes people from our community to say, wow, you've taken the time to sign? You've taken the time to learn about us? Um, it's sort of, you know, we're setting the gold standard on this pretty high. Uh, so basically, I think a lot of people come up to us and uh, uh, say, we, we want to work on this. And we say, well, you know, if you want to get started without having us involved, you have a long way to go. I love that. And, and I must say that when I started this in 1994, I certainly didn't expect it to be a 30-year journey. But one of the things I must say is that working with Googlers like Manfred and Garrett in our group, they're folks who came in, saw the importance of it, and have dedicated themselves to understanding sign, understanding the problems. And so um, getting this team together at Google has been just amazing. Um, we have a lot of very dedicated people to trying to get, get this technology out the door. So you both have this incredible collaboration and, and AI has really also been uh, a collaborator in a sense to help push this technology forward. Um, one of the things we've talked about in this season is really what it means to be a person of AI because the technology used to be reserved to researchers and then it's moved very much to developers who are building on it and now consumers are using it as well. And it is being implemented and used more and more into being able to to create tools um, for people to, it's, it's being included in being able to develop tools but also for those who can, the tool, they're being, it's being developed into tools that are actually being used by consumers as well. So we want to sort of, ex we're curious to ask both of you, what do you think it means to be a person of AI today? Well, Thad, you want to go first? Sure. So for me, being an AI person means not just optimizing some metric like accuracy. Instead, it means finding problems that are meaningful to improving the human condition and then making interfaces to that AI that are both useful and usable on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that, I think, is what the real challenge is, the, 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 the mixture of interface and AI to make things that are actually understandable, meaningful, useful, and usable in people's daily life. Yep, totally agree there with Thad. I think being a person of AI, it's not just uh, a label to me. Um, it's being able to 
fi uh, find the unfound voice, if you will, uh, to advocate the importance of uh, being included in the community. For example, the sign language technology, it's available and people just don't know how to apply it. Uh, or, or other technologies might be available and they don't know how to apply it to the signing community. So there's this huge gap that needs to be bridged. And here is AI that's available and able to do that and sort of blow people's minds and say, yes, here's this technology over here. We have this whole group of people that have this market need for it. Uh, and it's a long journey, but it's not an impossible one. What great answers from both of you. It has been such an honor to have both of you on. Thank you for coming on. And thank you so much to our interpreters as well who, for being here and for, for being a part of this conversation. And thank you so much again, both of you, for your time. Thank you. Thank you for the chat. If you or someone you know is suicidal, please contact your physician, go to your local ER, or call the suicide prevention hotline in your country. For the United States, the numbers are as follows. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255 or message the crisis text line at 741741. Both programs provide free confidential support 24-7. If you would like to learn more about our conversation or our guests, check out the links below. Please subscribe, and if you're feeling extra generous, give us a five-star rating. We would love, love to hear from you, so leave us a comment. We'll read every one. Until next time, thank you for listening.